Okay, we're going to talk about uh, pleural disease, and uh, the first part is going to be anatomy of the pleura and chest wall that is helpful in diagnosing different things and characterizing effusions. Now, I'm going to start first with anatomy, and this is a representation of there we go. A representation of a, a diagrammatic representation of anatomy at the interface between lung and chest wall. And starting on the inner side, we have lung, of course, and it's pink as it should be. Visceral pleura, pleural space, parietal pleura, a variable layer of extrapleural fat, endothoracic fascia, then the innermost intercostal muscle, intercostal fat containing vessels and nerves and then the inner and outer intercostal muscles. And this is more a representation of what it looks like on a CT scan. Uh, the uh, pleura itself is not usually visible. The layer of extra pleural fat is uh, variable in different patients. Sometimes you see it well, sometimes you don't. This uh, pointer is not going off. Oh, there it goes. Maybe I just needed to press it again. Okay. Now this is a cadaver that we uh, had some fun with trying to identify some of this anatomy. And what we see, first of all, is a little, uh, you can bear, really can't see it on, on the anatomy, but the parietal pleura is right there. And then just outside the parietal pleura is a little bit of white or yellow extra pleural fat. Then outside of that, the next thing we can see is the innermost intercostal muscle, and that runs between adjacent ribs right along the inner aspect of the thorax. Outside of that is intercostal fat containing vessels and nerves, and then outside of that, the inner and outer intercostal muscles. Now, if we look at how that is represented on a CT scan, this is what we see. First of all, the pleura itself is too thin to be recognized on a CT scan, even if you use super high resolution technique. Uh, anything you see that you think might be normal pleura probably isn't. It's just too thin to be recognized with any degree of certainty. Outside of that, and this is best seen in the paravertebral regions, is the extra pleural fat layer, then the innermost intercostal muscle, and you can see that quite nicely here running between these two adjacent rib segments right at the uh, inner aspect of the thor thoracic wall. Outside of that, the intercostal fat, and then outside of that, the inner and outer intercostal muscles. Now, when you're looking at a CT scan, you usually don't use these words like innermost intercostal muscle and things like that, a term that is sometimes used to describe the stripe of density that you see along the inner aspect of the chest wall running between adjacent ribs is the intercostal stripe. And the intercostal stripe is mostly made up of the innermost intercostal muscle, but also has the endothoracic fascia, maybe a little bit of extra pleural fat, and then the parietal pleura. But we recognize that as this intercostal stripe, again running between the inner aspects of adjacent ribs. Now the inner, uh, innermost intercostal muscle is anatomically absent in the paravertebral regions, so the most posterior or medial that you see that intercostal stripe is sort of the midpoint of the posterior thorax. You don't see it internal to that in a normal subject. There's ex, uh, intercostal fat outside it, nicely shown. Okay, now how do we diagnose pleural thickening? Well, the basic rule, and Brett's been talking about my rules all day, I tend to have rules. My rule for pleural thickening is if you can see the pleura as a distinct line with or without contrast infusion, it's thick. Doesn't matter if you inject contrast, don't inject contrast. If you can see it, it's abnormal. A linear, it may be recognized as a linear opacity internal to the ribs, Pleura runs internal to the ribs. The intercostal muscles do not. So if you see a stripe internal to a rib, it can't be the intercostal stripe. It has to be thick in pleura. A linear opacity internal to the innermost intercostal muscle separated from it by a layer of extra pleural fat. A distinct linear opacity in the paravertebral region. Because there is no innermost intercostal muscle in the paravertebral regions, if you see any white line uh, marginating the chest wall in the paravertebral region, it's abnormal. Also, extra pleural fat is also thickened, or is often thickened in patients with pleural thickening, and that makes all of this anatomy 
easier to see. Well, let's look at some examples, and these are in patients with asbestos-related parietal pleural thickening. First of all, here we have a distinct stripe or line or abnormality, something passing internal to the visible ribs. That is not normal. There should be nothing like that passing internal to the rib, and you can see that it's separated from the rib by a layer of thickened extra pleural fat. Here are the intercostal stripes or the innermost intercostal muscles nicely shown there running between the inner aspects of those adjacent ribs. Notice that we're seeing thickened pleura as a distinct white line running internal to the innermost intercostal muscle or intercostal stripe and separated from it by a layer of thickened extra pleural fat. That is also pleural thickening. And here then a distinct line in the paravertebral region where we should not see anything at the border between chest wall and lung. Okay, that is how pleural thickening is diagnosed. Now here are a few fake outs. Uh, this is a patient on the left here that looks like, uh, this person looks like there's a distinct white line in the paravertebral region that looks like uh, pleural thickening. But this is a CT scan done with a very edge-enhancing algorithm. You can see there's black stripes next to all the bones and white stripes next to the edge of the lung and things like that. And what we're seeing is some sort of an overshoot due to the edge enhancement that makes that look like pleural thickening. So you should not use an algorithm like this for most things in uh, trying to diagnose pleural disease or chest disease in general, I think. This is the same uh, scan reconstructed with a smoother algorithm, an algorithm more appropriate for uh, chest scanning, and you can still see here actually the uh, an intercostal vein, but that distinct white line at the interface between lung and chest wall is no longer visible. Okay, here's a patient, uh, and we can see white lines or stripes running internal to these both these posterior rib segments. On the right side, notice that there's a pleural effusion. There's the white there's the white stripe passing internal to the rib that usually represents pleural thickening, but here it does not. There is this pleural effusion. The pleural effusion is going to mark or show us where the parietal pleura is. The parietal pleura is right there where the effusion stops. And then the parietal pleura is separated from this white line by extra pleural fat. So this is something that's outside extra pleural fat. It's something in the chest wall, not something involving the pleura. And that is actually a muscle that's somewhat variable. Some people have it, some people don't. It's called the subcostalis muscle. It's only seen in the most inferior portion of the thorax. You can see both of these scans are down near the diaphragm. It's only seen posteriorly, and this would be a typical appearance where it's seen symmetrically passing internal to this most posterior rib, subcostalis muscle. It's not pleural thickening. Uh, this is a patient with a couple little something or others passing internal to the ribs posteriorly. These are simply prominent extra pleural fat pads. Uh, some people have lots of extra pleural fat. This person's a little bit heavy. And uh, these can mimic the appearance of pleural thickening on occasion. In this person who has large bilateral pleural effusions, you can see some of that extra pleural fat uh, internal to the rib segments. That's generally where these are most prominent, these uh, extra pleural fat pads. But this is just a nice example of how it can be seen when the patient does have fluid. <clears throat> now, you can use some of these uh, anatomic features on occasion to help figure out what you're looking at on a CT scan. This is a case from the county hospital where I work a day a week. And this person had trauma and rib fractures. And you can see these funny-looking lucent stripes here. It looks like they're floating within this pleural effusion posteriorly. <laughs> there they are. Point at them with the arrows. And these uh, lucent stripes represent extra pleural fat that is being displaced inward because of rib fractures and a chest wall hematoma. So if you can see those, you know that what is outside of those is chest wall and only what is inside is within the pleural space. Now that can be helpful on occasion in making a diagnosis, and I'll show you two nice examples. This is a patient with, again, trauma and rib fractures from the county hospital. <coughs> There's this complex something or other posteriorly that's sort of high attenuation, but mixed attenuation. Uh, and w what is this? Is this a pleural collection? Do they need to put a chest tube in to get out this presumed hematoma in the pleural space, or is this something else? Well, notice uh, 
that there is inward displacement of that extra pleural fat layer by this complex collection, and this does not represent something in the pleural space. This is, again, a chest wall hematoma that's displacing the extra pleural fat inward. Now contrast that with this case. Here is a patient with a sort of a complex looking something or other posteriorly. It could be in the pleural space, could be somewhere. I don't know where it is, but can the extra pleural fat help us decide where this is? Well, the extra pleural fat is in a normal location. There's no displacement of the extra pleural fat in this person. So this is not something in the chest wall. This is something involving either the peripheral lung or the pleural space. And this was an intrathoracic or pleural mass, a localized fibrous tumor of the pleura. Now here, simply comparing those two cases on one, on one slide, you can see the masses or abnormalities sort of look the same, but in one, the extra pleural fat is displaced inward, and the other, the extra pleural fat is in a normal location. Also, you can use extra pleural fat sometimes to help diagnose chest wall invasion and lung cancer. This is a patient with a peripheral carcinoma, and you can see that it is extending into the extra pleural fat internal to the rib. So this would be a uh, T3 or T4 carcinoma. Okay, characterization of pleural effusions using CT. Uh, we do this based on appearance on the presence or absence of pleural thickening, and sometimes on attenuation. These are the three things that I look for or look at when I'm uh, trying to make a diagnosis. Uh, this is a patient with a pulmonary embolus. You can see the clot in the interlobar left pulmonary artery. Uh, we can see bilateral pleural effusions. These are dependent and crescentic, and that's an important thing to mention. People always want to know uh, if an effusion is loculated or free, and usually if a fusion is dependent and crescentic in shape, it will be free and easily accessible to thoracentesis or a chest tube. This suggests a free effusion, but is nonspecific. You can have this sometimes with fluid that is loculated. This, on the other hand, is a patient who has a non-dependent and lenticular collections of fluid. Uh, we would predict with this appearance that the fluid is loculated, uh, and usually it is and that is important information to the clinician who's taking care of this person. This happens to be an empyema. Now, in characterizing pleural effusions, there are two types that we need to consider. These are transidates and exudates. A transidate results from alteration of systemic factors that influence the formation of pleural fluid. The fluid is low in protein, and the pleura itself is normal. This type of effusion does not reflect pleural disease. Now, contrasting with that is exudate. <clears throat> An exudate results from increased permeability of pleural capillaries. The, pro uh, the fluid is high in protein, and the pleura is abnormal. So this type of effusion results from pleural disease. And here are lists of different causes of exudates and transudates. Transudates usually heart failure, or overhydration, or renal failure, something like that. Exudates, pneumonia, pyema, tumors, connective tissue disease. You can read the list. <clears throat> but there are a number of causes, and these are typically associated with uh, some sort of pleural disease. Now, here is a patient who has a pleural effusion on the left side. Notice that there's some pleural thickening associated with it. We can see this distinct line internal to the ribs. That's parietal pleural thickening. But this person uh, has an empyema, and an empyema represents an exudative effusion. And one way you can make a definite diagnosis of an exudative effusion is if you see multiple bubbles of air within the <laughs> fluid. If you see multiple bubbles, it means that the air is catching on little fibrous septations or protein that's coagulating or something like that. So if you see multiple bubbles of air within a fluid collection, it's a complex effusion or an exudate in this patient, an empyema. The presence of multiple bubbles indicates the presence of septations within the fluid collection. You can diagnose it as complex and an exudate. Now, this is an empyema, and if you see loculation, as we see so nicely in this patient, that predicts an exudate, but keep in mind that if someone who has pleural adhesions develops a transudate, it will appear loculated, and on occasion you'll see a case that's confusing like that. So another way that the appearance might help you in suggesting what a pleural fluid collection is. Uh, the, the appearance of the pleura on CT is the most accurate 
thing you can use to distinguish exudate from transudate on CT, whether or not the pleura is thickened or invisible. If you see parietal pleural thickening on a CT scan on an unenhanced or enhanced study, that predicts the presence of an exudate. Remember that exudates occur with pleural disease. If you see thickened pleura, it's abnormal. That predicts the presence of an exudate. Thickening is simply pleura that's visible on CT. If you can see the pleura, it's abnormal. The sensitivity in four studies, all about the same, around 40, 50, 60 percent. So you don't always see parietal pleural thickening in an exudate, but the specificity is incredibly high. Uh, three studies, 100 percent. The study we did was 96. So if you see parietal pleural thickening, you can sort of hang your hat on an exudate being present. If you don't see parietal pleural thickening, you don't know. can be an exudate or transudate. So here is our friend with an empyema again. Notice that we're seeing pleural thickening. We see a distinct white line in the paravertebral region. That should not be there. That's pleural thickening. That predicts the presence of an exudate. I can say, looking at this, based on that finding, that this will be an exudate of effusion. Here a patient with a PE again, bilateral pleural effusions, no pleural thickening is visible. This could be an exudate or transudate. The CT scan does not help us in making the distinction. So if you see pleural thickening, it's helpful. If you don't, you don't know what that means. So the rules at this point, if pleural thickening is visible, the fluid is an exudate. If no pleural thickening is visible, it may be an exudate or transudate. Now, how about CT attenuation? Um, well, one study looked at the attenuation of exudates and transudates and found that the exudates were significantly higher in attenuation, uh, but the difference was small. Uh, they found that if you used a CT number of 13.4, it had reasonable sensitivity and specificity. But what this largely shows you is how worthless statistics can be, because their conclusion is the clinical use of CT numbers to characterize effusion is not recommended. There's considerable overlap between exudates and transudates in the 10 to 20 Hounsfield unit range. And this is some data from their study, Scattergram, Hounsfield units on the left. You can see clusters for exudates and transudates, huge overlap between the two. This is data from another study done just recently, the same sort of thing. In actual fact, it seems as, whoops, in actual fact, it seems as if the Transidates have higher CT numbers than the exudates. So, very confusing. Don't try to use CT attenuation to diagnose an effusion. You can't do it. Look at the pleura. One exception is hemothorax. Uh, hemothorax is pleural fluid with a hematocrit more than 50% of blood. It's usually 40 to 60 and approximates the uh, hematocrit. Uh, most do. Blood is usually 40 to 60 Hounsfield units, is what I'm trying to say, and that will approximate the patient's hematocrit. If you measure the attenuation of blood on a CT scan, that's sort of what the hematocrit is. So pleural fluid that uh, is 40 to 60 Hounsfield units is a hemothorax. Most are due to trauma. You can have spontaneous hemothorax due to rupture of some sort of vascular structure. Spontaneous pneumos can do it with bleeding. Coagulopathy, rupture of a pulmonary AVM, I've seen that endometriosis, which I've not seen. Here a traumatic hemothorax, great example with a fluid fluid level or a hematocrit level, 18 Hounsfield units anteriorly, and then all the blood is sitting posteriorly, 50 Hounsfield units. Now this is a patient with a lot of upper lobe bronchiectasis. You can see that the left hemothorax is relatively small. If you scan through the apex, you can see there's sort of a high attenuation fluid collection, and that measured I can't remember, in the range of 100 to 200 Hounsfield units, as I uh, recall. And I was a little confused about why pleural fluid should be high in attenuation. It was 100. This is TB, chronic TB, with milk of calcium in the pleural fluid. This is something that happens on occasion. Uh, it's a colloidal suspension of calcium salts within the fluid. Uh, it occurs with fluid loculation. You can see homogeneous high attenuation or sometimes a fluid calcium level attenuation 1 to 200 in most patients who have milk of calcium in their pleural, pleural fluid. Uh, chronic inflammation is typically the cause, and there's usually a history of pleurisy. 
Now, TB can also result in frank pleural calcification. This is no news, but this is just another cause of high attenuation pleural disease. You can see thickening there of extrapleural fat. Any patient who has chronic pleural disease will often have thickened extrapleural fat. Here, a, uh, an appearance where we see a very high attenuation in the pleural space posteriorly. This is secondary to talc pleurodesis. Whenever they put talc in somebody's pleural space and wiggle them around to get even distribution and then think they're causing a diffuse pleural fibrosis, it all turns up in the posterior costophrenic angle. It's an invariable finding. Uh, this is an unusual patient. You can see here a very low attenuation, something or other in relation to the pleural space at this window level, which is sort of a normal mediastinal window. It looks like air, but is just low attenuation. This is plumbage in a patient who had TB a long time ago with some sort of fat, fatty material put into the pleural space. <coughs> now, chylus effusion has fat in it. You might think it's low in attenuation, but as a general rule, chylus effusion cannot be distinguished from other fluid based on attenuation values. It also obeys the attenuation it also obeys the attenuation rule, which is don't use attenuation. Okay, well, let's just sum up at this point. If pleural thickening is visible, you're looking at an exudate. If no pleural thickening is visible, it's an exudate or transudate. Attenuation of 50 Hounsfeld units indicates a hemothorax, otherwise not much value. High attenuation, more than 100. Think of milk of calcium or talc, I guess, pleurodesis. And if you see low attenuation, it's pretty uncommon. Uh, can be seen with transidates, can be seen with exudates. Kyle or